Good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome Ms. Devina Mehra, Mr. Rachin Agarwal, Mr. Naveen Kalmat, and everyone else for the first global team. First Global's Indian PMS IS Super 50 has completed two years, and during this time horizon, it's the top performing multi-cap PMS in India. My heartiest congratulations to all of you and the entire team for that. Now, the entire audience is well-versed with our speakers, but let me, for those of us who are new, let me just start with a quick introduction. Ms. Davina Mehra is the founder, chairperson, and managing director of the First Global Group. She's an IMA gold medalist and has been awarded many accolades throughout her academic life. She started her career with Citibank, leaving in 1993 to found First Global. She also heads the research and fund management at First Global, a cell in charge of identifying key changes and inflection points in markets across the world for global clients. She's called out major market turning points time and again, and was an early investor in names like HDFC Bank, Amazon, Apple, etc. She's been widely quoted in Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, and other leading national and international publications, She's a frequent face on TV on all the top business channels. Thank you, ma'am, for taking out the time to be with us today. Mr. Achan Agarwal heads the Quantitative Research, Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning Unit at First Global, leading a team of highly qualified mathematicians and engineers. He has been extensively involved in research in various fields of mathematics and AI, including deep learning, NLP, genetic algorithms, et cetera, and their applications in asset management and investing. He has built scalable quantitative models that invest across a wide range of asset classes across multiple geographies and has successfully managed global funds for over a decade. He has an MBA from IIM Bangalore, where he was featured in the director's merit list and a BTEC in computer science and engineering from IIT Kharagpur. Thanks, Achin, for taking out the time to be with us today. So uh, just to give you an idea, this webinar, the main audience is SMFS clients who are existing FG investors, as well as those who are looking to add PMS to their portfolios. For the audience, we're going to cover this in the next one hour. We're going to cover some PMS basics, what a PMS is, how it should uh, deserve a role in your portfolio, focusing on the strategy of First Global IS Super 50 and the investment philosophy and mantras of First Global. Uh, we'll be we are doing a quick presentation followed by a QA. Hi, uh, and uh, thank you, Shreya, for a very kind introduction. Uh, so, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm happy to talk to all of you, uh, talking a bit about PMS as a product itself, because as Shreya was saying, that some people are not so very clear about what a PMS is, and then about what okay. we did do differently in our PMS. Uh, because as she mentioned, uh, our PMS has not only been uh, the top of our on a return basis, but on a risk return uh, basis, a risk adjusted return basis. And what time better than now to see what actually a risk controlled PMS looks like and how it performs in a turbulent market, like for instance, yesterday's market. So we have a slide on that also, uh, that how we handle that. Uh, so let me start off by why you should consider PMS as a part of your investment portfolio. And there are a few reasons to why it makes sense. Uh, first of all, of course, you must understand that the PMS is a structure, just as a mutual fund is a structure. So uh, what matters more than the structure is the fund management, the fund manager and the investment strategy or the investment philosophy behind it. Uh, whoever is doing the admin, can you switch this uh, uh, bell ringing every time anyone uh, comes in because this is very distracting. Please switch Yeah. Okay. Uh, so th this is the first thing that really you have to go behind rather than say that I will buy a mutual fund or a PMS. You have to understand what that mutual fund is or what that PMS is all about. And the basic, uh, basic difference in a PMS versus a mutual fund is that in the case of a mutual fund, you hold the fund units and the fund holds the shares. Here, the shares or the stocks or the securities may not be shares. It may be uh, things other than equity, depending on what kind of team you are invested in. They are all held directly in your name, in your DMAT account. It is not pooled with other investors. It is just that you are uh, allowing 
uh, for example, if you, uh, you know First Global is your PMS provider, then you're allowing First Global to um, uh, decide what you should hold in your account, but it is still held directly in your account. Uh, the second point sure. is that there is 100% Thank you, same for you. Sorry, is this somebody say anything? Uh, admin, can we mute all the mics during the presentation and we'll bring it up during Q&A? Yeah, it will be done in short. It will be, it will be done in a moment. Uh, Ma'am, we can please uh, proceed. Uh, I'm just uh, inform the team to uh, mute all the participants. Uh, Ma'am, you're on mute mode. Somebody must have muted me. Okay, so uh, can so can you switch off this as well? This uh, one enters. Please ask uh, whoever is doing the admin to switch this off. Okay, so the second point arises of the first one because it is held in your account. There is hundred percent transparency. You can see all, not just see your holdings, you can see all the transactions in your portfolio on a day-to-day -day basis because you have a direct login into your account. Then compared to a mutual fund, a PMS has far more flexibility. So, uh, uh, PMS actually has, uh, for example, in terms of how much cash you hold or what you hold in various market caps, uh, you can decide how you want to do that within a PMS scheme. You know, for example, some time back we had over 20% cash uh, because markets were extremely volatile, but that is not something a mutual fund always has the flexibility to do. In a PMS, again, you can choose uh, which asset classes you want to be in if, it, if you're looking at things beyond equity, and then, of course, the portfolio can also be customized to your uh, needs. I mean, normally we go with the same kind of portfolio for everyone, but we do have customers who have sensitivities, for example, who do not want to uh, buy alcohol companies or, uh, for example, uh, companies where uh, animal products are processed like meat products or leather or something. So you can put in those kind of, which is not possible in a mutual fund. And then I think the point that is very, very important that you have somebody answerable, somebody accountable. So like if we have a PMS customer, they can interact with the fund management team. They can ask questions on email. On occasion, we will be addressing webinars like that, or sometimes for larger clients, it may be a one-on-one -on -one also. Whereas mutual funds are faceless entities, no matter what is happening in terms of performance, good, bad, ugly, you don't have anybody you can hold accountable. So this was a general template of what is possible within a PMS. But the more important uh, reason is that we must uh, a more important thing which we need to focus on is that the way we do a PMS or a portfolio management scheme, which is very different from the way most of the industry run. So as, as I said right at the beginning, the important thing is not the structure. The important thing is the way things are being done. So uh, now what we find is that an artificial intelligence and machine learning driven quantitative investment uh, is disrupting the investment landscape. And if you do not move along with these changes, you would be rendered obsolete. And you cannot be cannot afford to be rendered obsolete. And this changing in landscape, I mean, I will give you an analogy which makes it clear. I mean, we often talk of changing of the playing field, but there have been cases where literally the playing field has changed, like hockey moved from grass to astroturf. When it was played on grass, it was an uneven surface. Then it mattered how well you dribbled your stick work and all of that. Astroturf made it even surface. And a different set of skills became important. How fast you can run, how 
fit you are and so on and why if you did not transform yourself in time you were rendered obsolete and which is what happened to india and in fact the whole subcontinent dominated hockey till the astro turf came in so now from 1930s to 1970s you dominated hockey and then you were out because you did not change your skill set tennis similarly moved from wave hood to titanium rackets with many you know intermediate stops and you could not play with yesterday's instruments and you know you born walk can't could came back with his wooden racket and he could not make a comeback because uh, the technology had moved on today and car maker cannot say i will stick to combustion engine and not look at electric vehicles they'll be left far behind and something similar is the fund management business uh, whereas uh, most of the industry whether it is pms or mutual fund is still stuck in the 90s or if not prior to that and uh, why is this changing why is the landscape changing here because earlier the edge of the fund manager used to be to get privilege information i mean not necessarily as insider information but you could meet a company you could uh, visit their plant and get some information which was not available to everyone and i have done a lot of that you know i have done i have seen countless plant steel aluminum auto components all of that gone to the dusty outskirts of the ncr hyderabad madras you name it and pretty remote areas in andhra and uh, even a place like renukut which is in the middle of nowhere in up so i have done all of that but that was then and, and internationally also it was the same a fidelity could sit in a closed room with a procter and gamble or walmart or ibm and get some information but now that has been regulated away so now what is the skill set that is required because now all you as a retail investor also can go and see a call transcript even if you can't attend the con call directly of when the quarterly results come out so now the skill set that is required is uh, managing and analyzing large volumes of data instead of looking for information and data and that is where you need the human plus machine model which is what we talk about so why human plus machine this is a very interesting nugget before i go into the details of that uh, you know many of us had heard of this ibm deep blue computer which in the 90s beat the world chess champion uh, gary kasparov but not many have heard of the sequel to that which was that there was a 2005 tournament where there was a team of human chess players who were good chess players but they were not world champions and who were supported not by any fancy machines but by laptops but that good enough human with a good enough machine could beat the best computer in the business which in turn had beaten the world chess champion so this is how human plus machine does better than both human only and machine only. only and the reason number one for that is that one uh, machines can analyze a very large number of securities uh, globally we analyze over 20000 securities in india we analyze something like 800 or so securities which meet our liquidity norms and come up with a list out of that now that is not possible for a human being to do or a team of human beings to do the other thing is not just the number of securities we look at hundreds of refined factors for each stocks like for example not just growth uh, but the first derivative of growth second derivative of growth so in a sense looking not just at velocity but acceleration and jerk and sometimes the you know, the signals come first in the higher derivatives and you can combine a very very large number of factors then the machine Machine is consistent. Let us say, I mean, I had to analyze twenty thousand securities. Yes, I can have a uh, thousand analysts looking at twenty uh, uh, companies each. But each of those thousand analysts will look at the same numbers, the same facts differently. A machine is consistent. Reason number four, very very important. A machine is bias free. All us human beings are products of our biases. i have written about it often i have made videos about it and you can read whole books about it you know like thinking fast and slow the halo effect 
uh, the invisible gorilla and so on. And I, I will not go into the details of this because that's a, a class, if not a module in itself, but there are many biases. For example, you will see a lot of fund managers waxing eloquent about their holdings, about the stories of their holdings, that why they are great, why the management is great, why the business is great, because human beings love stories, but the market doesn't care about stories. I mean, for example, you would hear this story of that uh, if you buy uh, great consumer brands which generate cash, you can never go wrong and you will always make money, but you look at the data, all those companies, for example, the FMCG companies, each of them individually have had between seven to 15 years of uh, huge underperformance. And many times underperformance on, uh, on the fundamentals also. If you look at this year itself, the market, I have not seen the data as of today, but you know, two, three days back, I was looking at the data and the FMCG index was, the, was among the worst performing indices for the year in spite of being an underperformer last year itself. So always there are myths built around things because human beings like stories, human beings, the bandwagon wagon effect because human beings like to be in a group, they want to be part of a group rather than be solitary. So, I mean, there are a whole lot of biases and no matter how well you understand them, you cannot get them out of your decision making because they were important to you once upon a time when you were in the jungle, you were trying to get away from a saber to tiger as a human being, all these biases help you, but in investing, they don't help you. So the machine is bias free. And reason number five is that as human beings, we all decline with age, but human, but machines improve. And one of the reasons is that the machine has no problem saying that I was wrong, that I made a mistake. And hence it goes back, it learns, it analyzes. Whereas as a human being, we have this huge mental barrier in uh, admitting a mistake, which again it was helpful to us once upon a time, but in investing, that's a big negative. So the, this, you know, but now the thing is that, so are the machines the answer to everything you can think of? No, we think human beings also have a role and a very important role. And that really comes at, Oh, okay, before coming to that, let me just quickly give you an overview of uh, what uh, what are the, I mean, I, I will not go into the details, but this is the first global investment tech stack, which is the different models that we use. For example, in Turbo, we evaluate this 20,000 plus securities on hundreds of parameters. We have a Weight Watcher where we look at how uh, different asset classes, the weights, change over time. So you know, commodities may underperform for 15 years, but at some point they will start to outperform. So you start, you watch out for that. Glocom, you look at how things move across the world. And many times you will find that industries uh, move together across the world and not just in obvious things. Like for example, you know that in metals, the uh, dollar price is a big determinant. So it, it is uh, likely that uh, aluminum producers around the world will move together, but it will, even in purely domestic markets, many times you will find that the patterns persist across uh, markets. So there are things like that, many, many, many things that we watch, or rather our systems watch for us. And uh, coming back to what I was saying, that human beings are still needed at two stages. The first stage is that you have to code the machine correctly. And this is why I mean, two things I would like to say, many people think uh, or say that we use quant methods. And I always say that's like saying that I use an Excel file. So you and I and 15 other people may know how to use Excel, but are we going to make the same financial models? No, we are not. It's, it's all going to be different. And in quant in particular, it depends on how much detail you go into, how much rigor you go into. And uh, you know, trust me, we have done it through a very, very rigorous process. So we've had people who were from technology, tech entrepreneurs who have invested with us, who said, you know, take us through the detailed process as to how you did it. And why do you say you have millions of lines of code? You know, how, where have you used it? And, and at the end of it, they said, you know, this is something that we have not seen even elsewhere in the world, let alone in India. So, but as I said, human beings are critical. You just can't have reams of computing power and have that as being good enough. So you have to have 
human beings who had expertise in the market, who had experience in the markets. So you, you are sure that your, the factors that you are using are logical and there are no spurious correlations. And, and, and in the world, there are many spurious correlation. If you plot nuclear energy against cheese consumption, the correlation is one you know, or you know, people drowned against something which is totally random. It will again be one. So uh, we have to make, and this is really the problem why a quant only system often goes uh, awry because uh, people just analyze a lot of data and if you analyze a lot of data, something or the other will appear correlated, but that may not make any sense. So you have to start with sensible factors and then test them out rather than the other way around. And the other stage where human beings are overlays needed is when things are not captured by pure data. I mean, the COVID crash being a very good example that obviously in the beginning of February, 2020, you did not no, I mean, it was not apparent from financials anywhere that of, of companies that there was this big, big trouble coming, but you, you could see things around the world. I remember in February, I had tweeted that you know, later on, all these things became commonplace, but at that time, for the first time, schools had shut down in Japan and in Italy, and there were these pictures of all the Roman tourist attra attractions absolutely empty of people and you said that this has never happened even during the world war so something strange is going on and which which uh, really informed our investment decisions of uh, uh, taking insurance of moving out of equities in multi-asset uh, portfolios which is why we largely sidestepped the covid crash i mean not that we did not go down but we go, went down far 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 less than everybody else the other thing I spoke about uh, fund management being stuck in the 90s or 80s or 70s. And the reason for that is that most old school fund managers make a virtue out of saying that we invest only in our circle of competence. And I say it's a euphemism for a comfort zone. And why should you as an investor be a prisoner of your fund manager's comfort zone that if she or he is comfortable, <coughs> for example, only buying banks and consumer brands if the market is at a phase when those things don't make sense and maybe you know it is metals and cement that are looking good why should you be constrained by that and also it means that your risk becomes very high because if you understand only two or three industries even if you invest in 15 20 stocks in two or three industries effectively you are taking only two or three bets because all of those will move together so they become highly correlated and therefore highly risky. I will just hand it over to Achin to walk you through some of our risk management uh, practices and our performance. Thank you so much, Devina. So uh, I'll start off uh, with risk management, which is a key, key pillar of our entire investment process. So we are driven by something that Charles Ellis had once famously said. He said that investing is a loser's game. Okay. So what that means is that the key to winning is to avoid the big mistakes, you know, avoid the big losses. And if you can do just that, you're already way ahead of everyone else. Right. And that is exactly what we have done consistently over time. We did that in March, 2020 when the markets were down 30, 35, 40%, and our funds were down, guess what, less than 10%. Okay, there was no other PMS, no other mutual fund in the country which had that sort of performance during the COVID crash. Uh, and it's not just a one-off example. I'll give you uh, an example from uh, something as recent as yesterday. We'll come to that in just a moment. That but the point is this, you know, it's all about staying alive during difficult times to fight another day. You know, our number one mantra to investment management is avoid the big losses, avoid the big falls. And then you participate in the upside through an intelligently created portfolio to the extent that, you know, we almost obsess over risk management, risk practices are embedded within every single step of the investment process. Starting from the definition of the investment universe, where, like Devina mentioned, we look at only the most liquid ends of the market, 
position sizing, having stop losses for each one of our positions, uh, ha having a very, very advanced portfolio construction methodology. And uh, another significant risk measure that we adopt in our portfolios, it's, it's our proprietary model, we call it the tactical insurance for portfolio protection tip for short where uh, what we do is we purchase insurance for the riskiest parts of the portfolio. So it's a dynamic hedge that protects the portfolio in the in, in the turbulent times, just like you know we buy health insurance, we buy life insurance and whatnot. So this is insurance for your investment portfolio, which is obviously one of the most important assets in anyone's life that needs protection. So, uh, so, just, so uh, Achin spoke about uh, uh, different market caps. So let me just uh, give you a perspective on that. For example, our uh, small cap exposure, even when we like small caps, is typically only around 10%. At the most, maybe it will go up to 13 14%, nothing more than that. Because we think you know, when things go south, uh, it's very difficult to get out of those positions. So... Uh, we always say in our PMS, you are paying 60% of the fees for risk management and only 40% for return management. Yes, Sachin, back to you. Yeah, and, and to add to that, so Devina mentioned the human plus machine combination in our investment processes, right? But when it comes to risk management, we don't rely on humans as much. In fact, our risk process, risk management measures are exclusively driven by the machines because humans are not good at taking losses. No prospect theory has taught us that humans find it difficult to book losses, which then end up escalating into a completely different order of magnitude altogether. So uh, the machines run the risk management measures where humans do step in is if through experience, so for example, Devina has lived through many, many different kinds of market cycles and she's seen many, many crises from very close quarters. So uh, when, when the team of humans does come in, that is only to make the risk measures tighter, never more relaxed. Okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is data from yesterday. I'm sure all of you were glued to the news feed and uh, tough day for markets. Uh, in general, and obviously uh, the geopolitical scenario is uh, not looking pretty, but if, if we uh, restrict ourselves to the narrow focus of what the Nifty 500 did yesterday, it was down by over 5%. But guess what? Our portfolios on average in the PMS were less, were, had fallen less than 2%, in fact, only 1.6% on average. Okay. This is not something like I mentioned that you know, uh, that's happened by fluke or by chance because this sort of uh, inbuilt protection is something that is very, very inherent to our entire methodology of investment management. This is exactly how we had protected our portfolio during the COVID crash. This is how we've protected the portfolio in the current crisis. And this, uh, this is something that we will continue to deliver going forward also. So just a small you know, a demonstration of, of what we mean when we talk about risk management, because unfortunately uh, in the industry, you know, everyone's just focused about return, return, return. Obviously return is important. That's why you are in the game. But what's equally important, if not more important, is capital protection. How do you manage the risks? So that is something that we take very, very seriously. Uh, Moving on, uh, what do the results look like? So uh, Shreya had mentioned that we've just completed two years uh, of our PMS, the India Super 50. Okay, so over the two year period, uh, we have delivered a CAGR of almost 50%, whereas the benchmark Nifty 500 has been close to 30%. And it's not just the benchmark Nifty 500 that we've outperformed. We have outperformed every single multi-cap and large cap PMS scheme in the country. And then I, I have a separate uh, comparison uh, between our PMS versus the rest of the mutual funds also. So let's start off with the PMS universe first. 
So what you see here, the breakaway green line right at the top, that's us. Then there is a huge gap. And then you have all the rest of the uh, players all clustered together. The period for this analysis is 1st of March, 2020 up to the 31st of January, 2022. Why? Because we went live in the last week of February, 2020. For the peers, we have only monthly data. That is what gets reported with SEBI. So we've taken the first full month of our existence as a starting period and uh, the data up till the last completed month. So uh, we look at this uh, data even more closely in the next slide. Okay? And uh, this is a really important slide and I'll be spending a few minutes here. So um, first and foremost, when you want to evaluate the performance of any portfolio, any scheme, you, you want to look at returns. Obviously that's the most important uh, criterion. So let's look at returns first. Okay, so as you can see, uh, we have outperformed not just the benchmarks, but every other large cap, multi-cap PMS scheme in the country by a huge, huge distance. Okay, nobody comes close to our 114% since our inception. The next best is below 75%. And even in calendar year 2021, nobody came uh, remotely close to us. But that's just half the picture. Okay? Returns are important, but what's even more important is what sort of risks are you taking to deliver those returns, which is where the rest of these measures are very, very important to evaluate and to understand. But before I talk about those measures, one thing that I'd additionally like to point out here is, uh, unfortunately, so most of these names that you see here on this list have not even beaten the nifty 500 in an absolute term so you know ifl alchemy motilal marcellus axis ask ambit they have not even matched nifty 500 returns over the last two years and and then when you look at the risk adjusted returns this difference becomes even uh, even even far greater so the column in red is basically the return divided by the volatility of returns. How smooth, how consistent, how stable have the returns been? Okay, so you take the return and you divide it by the monthly volatility of the return that the portfolio has delivered. You will see that uh, we are not just uh, slightly ahead of anyone else. I mean, the, the, the difference is huge. We are at 2.76. There is nobody at 2.5. Nobody even at two, the next best is less than 1.75. In fact, most of the names that you see here are in the vicinity of one and below one. Okay, that's your sharp ratio. And then another way to look at uh, risk adjusted return is to look at the gain to pain ratio, which is a very simple ratio, but very powerful. Okay, so it's, uh, the way gain to pain ratio is calculated is you take the net return that the portfolio has delivered in the numerator, and then you divide it by the sum of all the losses. Okay. Uh, now, if uh, so, so for example, if, if the portfolio has out of the 23 month period that we are looking at, if the portfolio has lost money in let's say eight or nine months, you add up all the losses. That's your denominator. So what the gain to pain ratio is telling you is what is the net gain that the portfolio deliver for every unit of pain that the investor had to endure. Once again, we are at 4.4. There is nobody even half that value. Okay? And then the last two columns are uh, showing how we've outperformed the Nifty 500 the maximum number of times. Okay? So the return has been most consistent. So high returns is great, but what's even greater is when those high returns are accompanied by a lower volatility, smaller drawdowns, and most consistent outperformance every single month. So that basically is the difference between luck and skill. Certain portfolios can deliver great returns just because if they end up being lucky for a period of time, but to be able to deliver high risk adjusted returns, that's a measure of true skill. And this is a performance with the rest of the large cap and multi cap PMS schemes. And we've done a similar co comparison with the largest large cap, multi cap and flexi cap mutual funds also. So here what you see is 
uh, you know all the major large cap multi cap and flexi cap mutual funds once again there is nobody that even comes close to us that green line still is significantly ahead of the entire peer group okay and once again not just in terms of returns in terms of every risk adjusted return that you can imagine the first global india super 50 has trumped every single mutual fund scheme also and the the key question here is why what why have we been able to deliver this kind of a return and that comes from a a rigorous process that devina spoke about and uh, you know the dedication to pursuing that process the richness of that methodology of that human plus machine combination and what that also means is that this performance it's it's not as if that uh, this was something that we were able to deliver by fluke this is repeatable this is exactly obviously not in terms of the absolute returns but in terms of the outperformance over what the broader market is doing that is something that you can expect on an ongoing basis so uh, you know uh, first global obviously has been around for many many years over three decades now and we've all always been known for our ground breaking research so what you see here on the left is our research on amazon way back in 2001 after the tech crash when the world had written off amazon business week came out with a cover saying can amazon survive in that same week first global published a strong buy report on amazon at 15 dollars the so first global was the only firm in the world to have a buy let alone a strong buy call on amazon and jeff bezos uh, reached out to us and personally thanked us for the support at that time we know what happened over the next 20 years on the right you see uh, the cover of our report uh, on hdfc bank from 1996 one year after its ipo you know at a split adjusted price of 3.8 rupees and so the cover shows a baby transforming into arnold schwarzenegger that's how first global so hdfc bank way back in 1996 and obviously you know these are just a couple of examples like she mentioned there have been you know uh, first global has routinely been ahead of the market and has called out many many significant pivotal turning points well ahead of when they occurred and we've received accolades all around the globe you know alan abelson renowned journalist when alan abelson says something the world sits up and takes notice he commended our research in his column in the barons we've got in front page coverage on the wall street journal we got extensive coverage when our fund side stepped the covid crash last year and we are known not only for our coverage on the you know us or the indian stocks but really for stocks from all around the world including china japan europe basically everywhere uh we are a team of battle hardened veterans like devina with her decades of hands on experience and prowess in investing not just in india but really all around the world and then you know we have a team of battle hungry youngsters like myself so our team comprises fundamental analysts data scientists computer science engineers all working towards one common objective to refine our edge every single day and there's a core investment team devina uh, like uh, she pointed out is an industry stalwart with more than 30 years of investing experience uh, and she has uh, you know ac- academic accolades all through her life at uh, lucknow university she won eight gold medals which is still date a record and she was a gold medalist at i am ahmedabad also i have the privilege of heading the quant research team we also have alok here on this call uh who's uh, been a pivotal part of the team for more than 17 years now so some of the uh, pieces that you saw on that exotex slide uh, alok built those pieces and continues to uh, provide very very insightful research using those kavita once again is also on this call she's been with us for more than 20 years now she heads uh, fundamental research for us and a lot of the global media coverage that you just saw that the, all of that is kavita's work and of course the team is much more than what you see here we have some very very talented and bright individuals 
in the fundamental and the quant teams put together, which is around 20 people large. And moving on to product. So uh, we don't believe in uh, a proliferation of product, you know, so uh, a lot of fund houses offer, you know, mid cap, large cap, small cap portfolio separately, then they offer thematics and sectoral funds and whatnot. We don't believe in all of that. So our thinking is very, very simple. When someone comes to us, they're looking for a solution and not another set of questions to be answered. So within the PMS in India, we offer two products. One is the India Super 50, which is an equities only model where we invest in uh, listed equities in India. Obviously stocks which satisfy a certain market cap threshold and a certain liquidity threshold. And like Devina mentioned, uh, across all market cap bands that can vary, but Obviously, it's never heavily tilted towards small caps. Small caps will never be more than 10-15% of the portfolio. Uh, so that's the India Super 50 equities portfolio. And then the second product that we have within the PMS structure is the IMAP, which is the Indian multi-asset allocation portfolio. So the IMAP mimics the equities portion of the India Super 50, and then it has uh, some fixed income, some commodities. Basically, it's a multi-asset, dynamic multi-asset product. So for someone who, who's not comfortable taking a full equity exposure, so uh, it, it offers a slightly lower, uh, a significantly lower volatility, but uh, keeps the same high risk adjusted return profile. So uh, that is in terms of a products and you know, at the end of the day, you need to be in safe hands, right? You need to be with people who've done investing for a long time, people who understand the inner games, right? Just like one goes to an experienced doctor and an experienced lawyer. Similarly, it's very important to work with an experienced fund manager because that experience in itself is very valuable. And when you marry that experience with the machine, what you have is a winning combination. And that is exactly what we have done. And that is the edge for you because when you are with us, you are with the future and your investments will be relevant from today for the rest of our lives. So uh, that brings me to the end of uh, this presentation. Uh, over to Shrey. Uh, Shrey, would you like to start off with the Q&A session? Sure, thanks Sachin. Thanks Devina for a very comprehensive and insightful presentation. So let me just take a couple of questions that we got before the webinar, mostly from existing clients, and then maybe we can open the floor for clients on, in the audience members right now. So one question that we have, I'll just club a lot of questions actually. So investors who uh, entered the fund about a year ago have seen about 40% returns. Investors who entered in September are seeing negative returns. That of course is a function of markets. But the question is, what should they be expecting this year? So, I mean, uh, yes, you're right that it is partly a function of the markets and also the fact that we are reasonably conservative. So, I mean, you've, you've seen uh, the markets fall and especially certain sectoral indices fall. Uh, we think this year is not going to be as good as the last year, definitely. Uh, but still, uh, we do not see the risk of a huge crash. And the reason for that is that the Indian markets are not above their trend line. They're still far below their trend line. You really had only one very good year, which is 2021. Even 2020 from the COVID lows was a big move, but for the year as a whole was only a 14, 15% move. If you look at India's position in, in the markets globally, uh, for many years, you were number 19, 20, 21, 24, like that. Only last year you reached number six. So it's been only really one year of absolute performance and outperformance. Uh, so this year we expect outperformance vis-a-vis uh, -vis the global markets and we expect uh, some absolute returns pro provided you choose carefully. I mean, this is going to be a choice of sector, choice of uh, uh, companies or stocks market. Uh, it is not going to be that everything goes up, that kind of market where you know, many people who came into the market just after that COVID lockdown think that markets go only up. That's obviously <laughs> not the case. And, and in equity markets, if you're entering, you're looking at four months or three months or six months is too short a period. So you have to come with, with a longer perspective. And if you do that, uh, if you're asking what you should do today, I would say that 
if you have money to invest, you should start in getting back into the market. So you should uh, maybe not put everything all together at once, but over two, three, four months, you stagger it out. It, it's a reasonably good time to be entering the markets. Achin, anything you would like to add to that? No, I think uh, you've covered this uh, uh, quite uh, well. I mean, given the fact that India has been coming out of a very, very long period of underperformance, so there's still significant headroom to grow. And just, just one point uh, to add to what you mentioned, Shrey. So anyone who would have come in six months ago, exactly six months ago to this state, would have not been down 8 or 9%. They would have been flat to down about a percent. So, I mean... So next question is from Mr. Kanishk. He says, can you delve a little bit deeper into how much do AI and ML dictate the decisions? And if you can give an example of a decision that proved wrong in hindsight that was driven primarily by AI and ML. So there, I mean, at a broad level, I'll hand this question also to attend, but at a broad level, uh, not 100% of our decisions will be right. Not 100% of any kind of fund manager, whether human, machine, combination are going to be right. So this is this is a given. In fact, one of the videos that I made was for that, that every time you make a decision, you tell yourself explicitly that if I may be making a mistake, this may go wrong. Because the best you can hope for is that 70, 75% of your decisions go right. You cannot even target that 100% of your decisions will go right simply because this is not a deterministic world. It is a world of probabilities. At the beginning of 2020, who would have said that airline and hotel business will go to zero for you know, six months or nine months of the year? So you could not have made that. If after living through that, you do not realize that uh, there is no 100% certainty of anything in life. So that's a given. So decisions, whether made by any system or us, some of them are going to be wrong. The way we do it usually is that the bulk of our portfolio is decided by a superset that comes out of, a, let's say, the through the system, we get maybe uh, 80 recommendations or 100 recommendations. And out of that, then we will choose the 50 or 60 stocks that we will invest in. Using, when we say human also, it is not completely arbitrary or subjective. Uh, most of it comes out of our other systems that we spoke about, like Agreement in Motion, Glowcom, Weight Watcher, which are also systems, but which require some human interpretation. So that is how we do it. So it is, it is not a black box. None of what we do is black box. So even when we say something a machine recommends, we always need to know as a human fund manager why the machine is recommending something, why the machine is not recommending or rejecting a stock. For example, you know, the machine is very good at flagging manipulation. You know, this, 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 this might be strange to people and as a human fund manager it was uh, a bit of a strange thing to me because I thought that at least this one thing the as a human being I'll be able to see but if, you know if someone is fudging the numbers themselves how will the machine catch that but the machine looks at many many factors and it manages to catch it because you're looking at everything but from how much auditor fees you are paying how often are you changing your accounting policies you uh, you know, is there a big disconnect between cash flows and profits on an ongoing basis? And, and, and see, our system is not static. It is ever evolving. For example, one of the things which we are adding on now, which is you know, to some extent we've added on, but to some extent it's still a work in progress, is analyzing non-financial or non-numerical data, looking at things like uh, uh, management reports or con call transcripts and then you'd be surprised at the kind of things that the machine can get out of that for example there is uh, looking at uh, something called complexity of communication which essentially means that is your communication becoming more vague so if over various quarters you see for the same company that their complexity is increasing means they're somehow not confident or trying to hide something you know that that's the hypothesis so, uh, Achin, would you like to add to that? Right. So, basically, the thing you have to understand is that it's not as if there's a human sitting, making certain decisions. 
and there's a machine sitting and meeting, making certain decisions and they're competing. That's not how it's structured. We, we call it human plus machine because all the decisions that go into the fund, into the portfolio construction, require inputs from both the machine as well as the humans. Right. And like Devina mentioned, one of the key things that we've done is we've increased the number of decisions that we can take because just, just, uh, I'll give you some very, very broad math, right? So if let's say 75, let's say you are a very, very skilled fund manager, or you have a very skilled machine and 75% of your decisions are correct. It's still probabilistic. Like Devina mentioned. So if you're taking a grand total of five decisions, that does not mean that 75% of five decisions will always be correct. It could be that none of your decisions are correct or all your decisions are correct in a small sample state. But now instead of five decisions, if you're taking a hundred decisions, 200 decisions, then you don't expect that deviation to be much, right? So if you're taking hundred decisions, you expect to be right 75 in 75 of them, what will happen? You'll be right 60, 65, 80, 85. So that operative range is closer to your expected value. And, uh, you know, in terms of uh, specifically about the machine, you know, machine does a lot of different roles like Devina was pointing out, identifying, uh, you know, um, fraudulent activities or misreporting manipulation. Another thing that machine does very well is combining different factors. So you can identify 20, 30, 40, 50, any n number of factors which are important to consider. No company or no stock will be great on all factors and terrible on all factors. It's going to be a mix, right? Which is where humans don't do very well. So for example, if I have great regard for the CEO of a company, I am very likely to overlook shortcomings elsewhere. And vice versa. So if I if I have this uh, preconceived notion that uh, the CEO is not straight, then even if the stock do, does well, if they're doing great things elsewhere, I'll still unnecessarily penalize that stock. So that objective combination of multiple factors to get the full picture is something that machine does well. And the second part of your question, uh, can you give us an example where the machine went wrong? I mean, many so like we said, 25% of the decisions that the human plus machine combo is taking will be wrong. So there's no dart of examples there. Sure, sure. that's great. Uh, Naveen, can we open the floor to questions from the audience now? Since we're running a little short of time, I have a huge list of questions, but maybe we can give preference to any live questions that we get. Right, please, please. Uh, we request uh, audience to uh, come forward and uh, raise your query. And while uh, they're doing that, I'd just like to add one thing that we talked about, uh, you know, Shrey mentioned a comprehensive presentation. So this is not a comprehensive presentation in the sense this is only about our India product, uh, but we have global products as well, which even as an Indian, you should consider. <laughs> but we'll do a presentation on that another time. Definitely, ma'am. I'd like your time in the future to take a presentation on that also. Yeah, so, so just... Uh, Thank you, ma'am. Investor so, uh, who want to raise a query, please raise your hand so that we can unmute yourself to put forward the query. Yeah, yeah, for yeah hi. So I have a question. You had mentioned that, you know, uh, the market since, you know, September onwards, uh, it has been quite volatile. So my question is that if you can segregate your portfolio into two parts, you know, one is before September when the market was up and after September when the market went down. So now since the market went down, a lot of people would have invested that, you know, invested money. Um, and I understand that, of course, uh, this market, you know, has been going down since then. What are the, you know, how are you mitigating those risks? Are you, you know, individually looking into the portfolios of the people who's, uh, you know, whose portfolio has gone down more than 1.65% that you had mentioned, because I understand that uh, individually, of course, uh, the downsize had been, ha is more actually. So are you looking at individually or total portfolio that you guys hold? And what are, how are you, you know, thinking, I mean, how, what are your an analysis to increase that? How are you mitigating the risk? Okay, first of all, I mean, there are, there is no great discrepancy between the portfolios because uh, all the portfolios more or less move together. They might be minor 
you know differences on on a certain day certain uh, transaction didn't go through or something like that but otherwise mm. uh, the movement will be all together right achin alok yes absolutely uh, when you say all together it would be same uh, i i mean i disagree because people who might have invested when the market had gone down and since then it has been going down because of a lot of you know economical factors do you look individually or in together only you look at the portfolio see as i said that all the portfolios have the same stocks in in the same proportion so they will okay. move together that minor there might be that certain day one trade did not go through or something like that but that will not cause any significant differences so it it is not as if that if you came on january 1 mm-hmm. your uh, 2021 your portfolio today will look different from somebody who came in in september no i mean everybody's portfolio is the same except people who have these kind of customizations that no alcohol or some whatever their or condition or yeah, some prime stocks whatever their stocks would be otherwise all general portfolios are all the same Okay. Um. Any factor considering economy is going so much of volatility? Any other factors that you know you consider uh, to ensure that you know return is positive? Even you know the market is you know, like five percent, it has gone down, but still. So that is what we 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 try to do as much of risk control as possible. That is why uh, as as. Uh, Achin showed that in yesterday's market, which was down five percent on Nifty 500, and in fact mm-hmm. down more on the small cap and mid cap indices, we were down only 1.6 percent. So you know we try to mitigate that risk as far as possible in terms of the choice of sectors, in terms of all the risk control measures. But I mean, it is not only that uh, the general market conditions will have zero percent impact on your portfolio. Okay, thank you so much. Are you welcome, Mr. Bittal? Yeah, please go ahead. Hi, good evening. It was a very knowledgeable, you know, knowledge gaining presentation. As such, my small query is this: Do you do only equities, or you do options as well? No, it is only equities, and option is only to the extent of hedging. So we spoke about that tip that Achin spoke about tactical insurance for portfolio protection. so that is done through derivatives uh, through the hedges and in fact the pms guidelines also do not allow derivatives beyond their use as hedges i understand it thank you very much thank you yeah the my question uh, was to do with the mi model the ml model that you guys create when you are training the model you mentioned that you look at technical data for companies do you also look at fundamental data like uh, social media presence Uh, blogs news and if so what is the kind of weightage that you give to you know fundamental data versus uh, technical data when you are training the model i'm assuming this is supervised learning for your model so i mean when you say technical data it is not uh, technical data it is fundamental <laughs> data that we are primarily using which is all the financials and other uh, data for the company so uh, so that's so the primary data is uh, is the fundamental data the bulk of the data let me say and of course we do use the price data etc also which is the which, which you're saying the technical side so uh, but if you're talking about unstructured data like uh, social media or uh, this uh, as i said that things like con call transcripts uh, management reports etc we've started using it but that's still work in pro- uh, process so it's not uh, that part is i i can't say is 100% there in the model yet right so uh, unstructured data is much more complex to use okay so, so yeah i would like your weightage, to add your weightage would be skewed towards uh, what you are calling fundamental data your prices prices no, not what i am calling that is what is called fundamental in in no, any financial uh, markets or in financial okay. text that is fundamental data that is what is called fundamental data fair enough yeah so but as, as if you're talking unstructured data that is something we are working on um for example you know hdfc bank oh, uh, you know while we've liked it a long time uh, 
So now we don't think that's the best place to be in. And a very interestingly, one interesting thing which we found in their con calls was that over the quarters, their con calls have been growing longer. The management part has been growing longer. Q&A has been becoming shorter. And the other interesting thing was that it has now less numbers, less, less, fewer numerals in their con calls and more words. So that was that was an interesting finding from there. Achin, anything you would like to add? Right. So uh, like Devina mentioned, we the, the core of what we use the, use the data set is financial data, right? So the income statement, balance sheet, cash flow statements, all numbers from that. And obviously we look at price data also. And uh, we are looking at con call transcripts. Another data set that we look at is governance data. Now, there's a lot of interesting data around that. So, for example, uh, you know, what is a key management compensation? How does it compare to the compensation of the rest of the organization? Uh, what, uh, how many, how much of the promoter holding is pledged? What is the composition of uh, key committees? Uh, what sort of independent directors does the company have and uh, what sort of other companies are they on? So basically the entire directorship network. So a lot of very rich data is available. And if you talk about our global products, which is not very relevant here in India, but a lot of very well-structured analyst estimates are available where you can look at dispersion of analyst estimates, what sort of provisions are being made, beats and misses. So some very, very rich data is available. And then what we do is we construct intelligent factors out of that. And once you have these different factors, the weightage to each factor is obviously coming from a, a supervised uh, learning algorithm, right? And these weightages are not constant. And uh, that is not to say that uh, we use only supervised learning. There are certain parts of the process where we use unsupervised learning also. So for example, uh, when you uh, talk about industry wise exposure, the typical way in which most people do it is by classifying each company into one particular industry. Now, how do you categorize a company like Reliance, right? It cannot be categorized in one industry, but that's what traditionally has been done. So what we do is we find the sensitivities for each company to various sectors. Okay, so each company will have sensitivities to multiple sectors and then we look at our sectoral exposures overall, right? So that comes from an unsupervised clustering algorithm. But so, I mean, ML, like, like, like I mentioned earlier, it's not as if some one set of decisions are being taken by the human, something else by machine. It's a fairly involved process and there are many, many different decisions that need to be taken and we use uh, different kinds of technologies in each in each place. I hope that answers your question, Mr. Gopal. It does, to a large extent. Thanks. This is the uh, Sharad Ji's last query you would like to take for this session. And uh, uh, yeah, am I audible now or no? Yes, yes ma'am. Uh, okay, uh, I'm I'm just new to it, so. Uh, very deep knowledge about everything. But, uh, my query is like, how do you decide on which day you're going to invest the money? Like uh, the market was so volatile, like on uh, Tuesday it was 57,000 and on Wednesday it went crash down. So how do you decide on which day you're going to put the money? I don't know if my question is very relevant or not. Basically the volatility that you're talking about, that's... Uh... I mean, it's, it's uh, this kind of a volatility that we've seen over the last two days. It's not something that we encounter every day, right? Usually the markets are more generous than that. Uh, but uh, generally what the way we, we uh, do this is unless uh, it's a scenario that requires, uh, you know, significant attention. So, for example, something like now, right? But most of the time, the capital, when it comes in, it's deployed within the first couple of days, three days. So in many ways, you, the investor is making the decision of the timing when you want to invest. And what we are doing is once you've decided that, okay, fine, I want equity exposure starting today, we are giving you the best possible equity exposure that day onward. So we don't take that call of timing 
except for certain very very extreme situations so for example over the last couple of days we've had certain investors coming in and telling us look the markets have corrected so now we want to add and people have been topping up their investments right so that question of that decision of timing is with the investor most of the time okay like we can decide like on what the day i want to i want my investment to be done like that i can communicate to you ha so you can fund your account accordingly so whenever you want the investment to be done you wire the the amount on that date and we'll be able to deploy it uh, as per your instruction okay 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 thank you thank you so much thank you so much thank you thanks thanks achin uh, thanks ma'am uh, for uh, addressing the investors query